Philippians 4, 1 to 9. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Iodia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, keep these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Well, welcome, Wimborne Alliance Church family. Thanks for tuning in and joining us today for another uh, sermon video. Uh, if you're watching for the first time, uh, thanks for finding us online, and, uh, and I hope you're blessed today. You can find our other videos and online sermons at our website at www.wimbornalliance.com or through our Facebook page or you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. And I would ask that you just like and share and subscribe to your heart's content. But thanks again for joining us today. Each week we have someone come in and read scripture for this video and I just appreciate Maureen doing that this week. And so thank you, Maureen, for ministering God's word to us in this way today. We're beginning a series, we're a couple weeks in, that I've called Discernment for Direction in Difficult Days, with the subtitle that reads, Looking to the Images of the Church in Scripture for Guidance to Live Out Our Mission. I, re I recognize it's a bit of a mouthful and it's a lengthy title, but we're going to explore the various images of the church that's presented in Scripture, not all of them, but a few, with a view to discerning a way forward during these COVID days. And the question that we're going to keep coming back to is what is the Christian response to COVID-19 and its effects on our society? What is our Christian response to COVID-19 and its effects on our society. And so as we go through the various images of the church that we find in Scripture, I'm confident that we'll find guidance in our perspective and in our, in our decisions as we continue to make our way through this time. The mission of the church, our mission, to point to Christ, to lift him up, to follow him, to make disciples, has not been in quarantine. It's not been in lockdown. And in fact, it's more relevant now than ever. We need to learn to think Christianly as we respond to COVID-19 and its effect, if its effects on our society. Not just to react with motion, emotion. Craig Gershell, a well-known speaker, says, when your emotions are high, wisdom is low. When our, when our emotions are high, wisdom is low. And very insightful. And so as we're, today we're going to start to consider how to think it through. How to think it through when we're considering our response these days. Our guide for living as Christians is God's Word. Uh, the Holy Scripture, the Bible. And before we look at several verses today to help us, let's pause for prayer and ask the Lord to enable us. O oh Lord, in your mercy and kindness, open your word to us and open us to your word. Amen. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to open it or you turn to open your phone or your device and we're going to flip through some, some texts in the New Testament. We're going to start with 2 Timothy and 2 Timothy 2, 
and 16. And I'll just read that. No, 2 Timothy 2, sorry, 7. And Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says, Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Think over what I say, and the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And we turn over a few pages to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to discern good from evil. Turn back a few pages to 1 Corinthians in chapter 14 and down to verse 20. Paul writes to the Christians in Corinth. He says, Brothers, do not be infants in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. He says, Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. And then in, in Philippians, we heard Philippians 4 read for us today, just uh, verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And so these verses are written in a, in a number of different contexts. The Apostle Paul, writing from prison, writes Timothy to think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. These words to Timothy uh, were written from a place of hardship and suffering. And Timothy also was probably in a difficult season of life and ministry. And so these words, think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. These words are applicable to us today. In, the writer, in, in Hebrews, the writer urges his readers to have their powers of discernment trained by constant use to distinguish good from evil. He's urging his readers not to be immature in their knowledge and handling of Scripture and how they apply it to daily life. He urges them to become proficient in discernment, in thinking through issues and difficult things by having their thinking trained by constant practice. These words are so timely for us today because we have many decisions to make almost daily as a constant stream of information comes across our path each day. And then in Corinthians, when Paul writes to the Christians there in that city, he says, brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. He's, as the Corinthian church struggled to find their identity and to stay on mission in a very pagan and sexually immoral culture, the Apostle Paul reminds them of who they are and what they're called to. In the middle of dealing with messy cultural and personal issues, Paul reminds them to love one another, to use their spiritual gifts, and to think through these things with wisdom and maturity, not to react out of their own emotion, their own personal preference, or even their own pain. Again, the scripture is so timely for us today. In these verses, as well as the verses from Philippians that Maureen read for us earlier, we're urged to think through, to think deeply, to think maturely, to apply our mind to the things that we're discerning. The, the passage in Philippians reminds us to think on things that are true. The implication of this, even this first instruction to think on things that are true, the implications are huge. We've talked about before how truth is always moral in nature. Truth always has a moral implication. And as we're going to discover that as we grow in skill, as we practice discovering the truth that is behind these issues that we face every day, we're going to find out that there is, in fact, a moral response to all truth. And we're going to find how that applies to us today 
in COVID-19. The question remains though, and we come back to this, how do we think through, how do we discern our response to COVID-19 and its effects on our society? This is a loaded question. And I hope just to bring some clarity that will be helpful. Thinking, especially deep thinking, is something that has largely gone by the wayside in recent years, especially with the advent of the smartphone and the internet. A quote that I read and had for quite a while beside my computer monitor said, the internet is a friend of information and an enemy of thought. We are, we are urged constantly not to think deeply through things, but opt for the abbreviated, condensed, prepackaged version. We don't want to wade through all the facts and the opinions and perspectives and information. We would prefer to have someone summarize it for us in a few points and then tell us what we should do. A young adult several years ago, a friend of mine, commented to me that with the internet, with all the readily available information and perspective and opinions, one of the effects of that, it, it has rendered many of us incapable of deep and sustained thought. And I would tend to agree. The thought that we're considering is not just the absorbing of information. That's knowledge. Discernment is not just the gathering, the absorbing of information. Rather, discernment is assigning moral value to that information. Discernment is evaluating the information, evaluating the perspectives, evaluating the opinions, and then assessing the moral and spiritual status and implications of that information in various situations, different courses of actions, uh, to various individuals or groups or even movements. Discernment is making distinctions and then assigning value, assigning moral value to those distinctions. Biblical discernment is thinking through the issue, making the necessary distinctions, and then assigning value to those distinctions based on the Word of God and the principles found within it. And the question comes up, how then do we discern? What is the process? There's no possible way I can give a complete outline of how to do biblical discernment in our time together today. I just want to lay out um, some basic principles and a bit of a process of biblical discernment. And as you watch, it might be helpful for you to jot these down, uh, maybe pause the video and just jot down these different points and perhaps that will help you remember and, and uh, help you in your practice of discernment. The first thing that we, want, we have to do when we're discerning something is we have to identify what exactly it is that we want to discern. We need to be precise. When, you know, if we can write it down, it will be much easier and it's going to be much more accurate and concrete. It's amazing how much clarity happens between an idea in our mind and the end of our pen. So we have to identify exactly what we're trying to discern. The next thing is to clarify, and that's just to say, what is, what is my understanding of this issue? What do I know now? What is my understanding on this side, or this side, or this perspective, or that perspective? What do I know now? And this will lead us to, to other questions of what do I need to know? After we clarify, we need to assess. We need to assess the importance of the thing that we're discerning. What's at stake here? Is this a major thing? Is this is this a doctrinal issue? Is this a cultural issue? Is this a personal issue? Who might be affected? How important is this particular thing that we want to discern? How important is it in the big scheme of things? And so we need to assess it. We need to pray. We need to pray all the way through this uh, process, but especially, um, but, but especially at this point. The next step is to take note of our instinct and our conscience. What is your instinct in this matter that you're trying to discern? What does your gut say? It's worth noting. It, it might not be 100% accurate or right, but it's worth noting. What does your conscience say? 
What does your conscience say about this issue? Not that your conscience is infallible. We need to train our consciences using, using the Bible, but what does your conscience say? And, and this is a look in. What is our response? What is our reaction? And if, if we take the time to determine this and to evaluate it and to, and to write it out and to be precise about our instinct and our conscience, we get a good look at what's going on inside of us. And, and often that is a key to our response. Sometimes we respond out of motion. When we do that, wisdom runs low. And so take note of our instinct and our conscience. And then we turn to Scripture. What does Scripture say about this matter? We, we may not be able to find a chapter and a verse. It might be a cultural thing we're trying to figure out or, or, or something like that. We might not find a, a chapter and a verse for this particular thing, but we will find guidance. We will find it. We will be able to find scriptural principles that apply in this, in this thing that we're trying to discern. Sometimes we have to think to the question behind the question or the issue behind the issue, the principle behind the question behind the issue. Think deeply through the thing. This requires really deep and sustained thought, often several hours of just thinking and mulling, asking questions. What is the issue here? And prayer is invaluable to allow the Spirit of God to guide our thinking. But we have to do the work. We have to do the work of deep and sustained thought in order to discern properly. And then use whatever resources you have access to. Our phones are tremendous resources. We can access all sorts of things. Uh, read authors and theologians that you trust. See what they have to say. And also pay attention to what the church has historically believed down through the centuries. Take advantage of all these resources as we, as we discern. And then we need to do the hard work of distinguishing. What, what are the points of agreement or disagreement with the issue from Scripture? Where, where does this issue, where, where does it agree with Scripture and where does it depart? What is precisely that point? What, we need to make distinction and evaluate. And this is, this is hard work. This is hard uh, thinking work. And it takes effort and time. After we distinguish and we, and we make our conclusion, we then need to apply. Discernment always results in, in actions. We think and then we do. And then we need to ask, what is the action required from our discernment? How do we live this out? What is the moral implication from the truth that we've discovered through this process of discernment? Now, I realize that's a ton of information to process. And, and I'll bet probably that it didn't sink in too much, so rewind and play it back if you need to. But I think if you write the steps down and think through them, it'll be much clearer. I suspect part of our trouble these days is that we don't clarify the issue that we're trying to deal with. There's so many aspects and issues and overlapping parts in this COVID-19 world that we're living in. One thing that might be helpful is to think of COVID-19 as a stone that is thrown into a perfectly calm pond. A stone that is thrown into a perfectly calm calm pond. The stone soon disappears from sight. It sinks. But the ripples go out and out and out and get bigger and bigger and bigger and last a long time. Many of the issues that we're needing to discern our way through these days are the ripples, not necessarily COVID-19, the virus itself. And the question we need to keep coming back to is what is our Christian response to COVID-19 and its effects, all the ripples on our society? And as we think through our Christian response, we inevitably come back to what is our mission? What are we here for? What are we to do? What did Jesus tell us to do as his church? 
And so whether we're working through our responses to some of the restrictions that have been in place, the protocols that many store has, have, whether to wear masks or not to wear, what is going on in our local context, in our hospitals and schools, for example, and, and in our province, in our nation, uh, nationally, and even in our world. We need to walk through these steps of discernment that we've outlined and to use our minds to explore our own response and then get to the root of that and then pursue what is right and true and honorable so we can live out our lives in a way that points to Jesus and proclaims all that he has done for us and in us. And then we need to do all we can do to bring others to a saving knowledge of Jesus as well. We need to train our thinking. We need to grow our conscience so it's informed by God's word and sensitive to his spirit. We need to ensure that our thoughts and attitudes and actions reflect the character of Jesus. So often in these situations, what is critical is not so much what we do, but the manner in which we do them. What our heart attitudes are, what our thought patterns are, what our motives are. We can do the right thing. We can be thinking through and processing information, but we can be totally wrong because our heart isn't right. As Christians here in Wimborne, it's my prayer, and it's our calling and command to reflect Jesus in all we say and think and do. It's our calling and responsibility to respond well as Christians in COVID-19 and its effects on our society, and we can only do that as we think through and discern what is good and right and true, and as we live out the moral implications of that truth. I'm excited as to the weeks that are going to come as we work through the various images of the church that are presented in Scripture. I think we're going to discover in these pictures of the church some real help to help us live out our identity as Christians and live out our mission as the church of Jesus Christ. And so I encourage you to follow along and to, and to engage in that in the, in the weeks to come. But thanks so much for joining us today. I appreciate you tuning in and watching. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thanks again for watching. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Till we meet again.